All right. Yes. Uh huh. Being released. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay, so it's still nauseous. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if your stomach's empty, it's going to, you know, it just fills with acid and you get, yeah. You get nauseous, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. All right, well, thank you. All right, so so hopefully tonight, today, Grethel's going home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. Okay, very good. Well, I'm sure she'll be much more comfortable and happy at home. All right, so uh, so that's good news about Grethel. Um, well, uh, so let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll get uh, get into our class. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here tonight to study your word. We pray that you'll bless us in our study, that we might understand um, uh, the what we read, understand uh, the events of the history of your church, and that uh, what we read and what we understand will help us to be more like your church and more like your uh, your people and more like your son. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins and that you will help us to uh, be more diligent to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're in Acts chapter 11. Um, we just finished with, um, let's see, more, most recently, uh, or recently we talked about the conversion of Saul, who would be... The uh, you know for better for lack of a better word the apostle to the Gentiles, um, and now then we talked about Peter who converted the first Gentile to Christianity, and so um, that's where we left off in chapter eleven where Peter gives his explanation to the uh, the party of the circumcision in uh, back in Jerusalem when he gets back from. Uh, Cornelius's house. So that's all taken care of. Everyone understands that the Gentiles are now part of the church, that salvation is for the Gentiles as well as for everyone else. And so we're going to turn our attention back to uh, to another place, the town of Antioch, which is going to figure into the history of the church in a in a in a significant way. So beginning in uh, verse 19 of chapter 11, I'll read through the end of the chapter. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. 
So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. All right, so, uh, so kind of a an interlude here, where we are reintroduced to Barnabas and Saul after having discussed Peter, and um, we're going to find them in Antioch, and that's that's going to be important because later on, Barnabas and, and Saul, who becomes called comes to be called Paul, launch their missionary journeys from Antioch. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of important in the progression of things. But notice what, what's happening here. Okay, we're, we're back on the scattering. And the scattering was mainly the work of who? It was God's work, but at the, at the hands of who? Who physically... Yeah, and, and who was key in that persecution? Saul. Saul was key, key in that persecution after Stephen was stoned. Saul, Saul went around breathing threats and you know getting letters from the from the uh, the temple um, leaders and going and throwing them in jail and, and so on and so forth. And so it was this persecution, this scattering over the uh, uh, that arose over Stephen that caused them to travel as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Um, and so, as we discussed before, as as they're being scattered, they're teaching people. Well, it says at first they were teaching no one except Jews, but then there are some that teach uh, men of Cyprus and Cyrene in verse uh, 20, teaching the Hellenists. Now, have we seen the Hellenists before? We've seen that term before. Where have we seen the Hellenists before? Okay, so if we look at Acts chapter 6, it was the Hellenists that rose up with the complaint about their widows not being served um, in the daily ministry. And so that's where Stephen was first introduced because he's one of the seven men chosen to make sure everybody gets served, including these Hellenists, these Greek speakers. And of course, at that time, they would have been they would have been Jews. We understood that that the the church was made up of only Jews at that point. Um, we see Hellenists again in the context of the conversion of Saul, because after he is converted, um, when he goes to Jerusalem in Acts chapter nine, it says in verse twenty nine, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. Okay, so again, these would be he's in he's in Jerusalem speaking with Jews in Jerusalem, and these are Greek speaking Jews, Hellenists. Okay, is this the same concept here? These Hellenists that we read about in Acts chapter eleven. Now remember, it says they went they traveled in verse uh, nineteen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the word to no one except Jews. But then there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. So it seems like this is a Hellenist in contrast to a Jew. And yeah, okay, so, so as it turns out, the term Hellenist just means Greek speaker. Okay, Greek speaker. So, so it, in the passages we've looked at before, they were Greek-speaking Jews. And in the context, we could tell these are Jews. In this context, there's a contrast to the Jews. So these are Greek-speaking Greeks. <laughs> these are Greek-speaking Gentiles that we're talking about here. And that's why this is so, so novel, because up until now, we have one Jew, Gentile, and his household, Cornelius. And now we have this starting to spread into Cyprus and Cyrene where people are teaching the Gentiles apart from Peter. Um, and, so, and so the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Okay, so now we're, we're spreading into a movement, um, a group, uh, a large group of Gentiles who are coming to the Lord. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so, so they're from all over the place. The Cyrene is down in northern Africa. Cyprus is, a, is an island off of, in the Mediterranean, right? Antioch is up in, in uh, Syria. All right, so, and we've got Jews, and we have Gentiles. And they're all coming together here in this town of Antioch. Okay, so this, this is a, a pretty, pretty good mixture of people here. And um, the hand of the Lord was with them, okay? Right, so, so God is in, in approval of all that's happening. And the church of Jerusalem hears about it and they send Barnabas. Why do they send Barnabas to Antioch? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so Barnabas was a, a trustworthy uh, person, right? It says he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's a good man, um, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And and so this is someone the apostles could trust to go to Antioch and do what. Okay. Okay. All right. To to observe the the ministry there, and what does it say Barnabas does? Okay. So so ultimately, what Barnabas does there is he he sees he sees the grace of God in verse twenty three. He is glad and he exhorts them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So Barnabas comes and he says. I see God working here. This, this, is, this is the church. Okay? Um, and he exhorts them to remain faithful. And um, uh, with steadfast purpose, it says. Okay? So what does that mean? To remain faithful with steadfast purpose. To be true. Okay? Uncompromising. Right. Right, so this is not just some new religion that they've joined, some new guy to follow and to worship, this Jesus guy. This is a new way of life. This is their new purpose in life, is to be a Jesus follower, to be a disciple of Christ. Okay, uh, So they need to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. It's something for us to, to emulate. Right? Um, it's, not, it's not just meeting with the saints. It is a way of life. It is our purpose. Um, just like it was Jesus' purpose every day to go out there and be Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's what we're supposed to do, is go out there and represent Jesus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Barnabas, Barnabas, uh, a great many people were added to the Lord. The church is still growing there with Barnabas, helping them out. And... So Barnabas goes to Tarsus to look for Saul. Why did he do that? Why do you think Barnabas went to look for Saul? Antioch's a... Iron sharpens iron? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what we're getting at. Barnabas needed help, right? This, This church is growing... It was, it was a task that needed more than one person, I, I believe is why he went to look for Saul. Um, and so he, he went and he finds, he finds Saul. Now, Saul is in Tarsus. That's where we left Saul. That's where they sent him after the, the Jews, the Hellenists, were going to try to kill him. They, sent him. they took him to Caesarea and then sent him to Tarsus, uh, which was his hometown. And that's where Barnabas finds him. He brings him to Antioch, and for a whole year... They met with the church, taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. All right, so. Yes, now isn't that interesting? He is still called Saul here. Um, and I haven't, I forgot to look ahead to see where he is first called Paul. I think it's coming up very soon. Uh, in chapter 13, he's still Saul. In the middle of chapter 13 is where he's first called Paul. So when we get to chapter 13, we'll have to take note of that and see if we can figure out why the switch. All right. So, so he's still Saul at this point. 
And but he is there. It doesn't say Barnabas is teaching Saul. It says Barnabas and Saul are working together and teaching the people. Okay. Now, what about this idea of the disciples being called Christians? Why do you think they were first called Christians here in Antioch? Okay, I've heard that before, that it's, supposed to, that it's meant to be derogatory. It's not widely used in the New Testament. Um, it's used here and by uh, Agrippa. Almost, you, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Um, it's also used in, in, uh, in 1 Peter. Um, and I didn't, I didn't write that into reference, but it's used in, it's used in 1 Peter. <coughs> um, Yeah, and I could go either way with that. I mean, if if you look at Christ, Wayne uh, talked many times about the reproach of Christ, what Christ represented, what the cross represented. Christ was a bad guy. I mean, to put it in in blunt terms, Christ was a bad guy. He was a villain. He was crucified by the Roman government. Only villains get crucified by the Roman government, right? And so, so to be called a Christian could very well have been derogatory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, and 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 the Christians came to be thought of in that way as seditionists, and that's why the persecution was so so great. Um, but to to look at it just on the surface, the term Christian is just a Greek name for someone who follows Christ. All right. Right. Right, exactly. That that's the way to think of it. Christian is the Greek is the name of Greek origin. Uh, Chris, Christios, I think, or Christianos is the actual Greek, and Christian is a transliteration of that. All right, right. That's a very good point. Right. So so just because you know people might have started them calling, oh, look at those Christians over there, you know, that's. That name has been elevated, and that's the way God works often. Yeah, um, so it's it's interesting, but it is appropriate that it's in Antioch, a very Greek place, that we would see this name start to pop up, as opposed to you know the disciples of Christ or the way or you know, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So they're in Antioch. The church is growing, and then. Uh, prophets come down from Jerusalem in verse 27, and one of them is Agabus, and what is his prophecy? Right. Great famine over all the world. And uh, it says this took place in the days of Claudius, and there is verifiable historical evidence of famines in the days of Claudius Caesar. Um, and... and, and, um, And it says the disciples determined to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Now, let me ask you this question. If the famine is supposed to be over all the world, then how come the Christians in Antioch have it so good? Aren't they going to have famine also? (laughs) Yeah. Okay, the historical evidence is that there were great famines and they were in different places in in, on, on, in the Roman Empire during Claudius's reign, and Judea was hit pretty hard with those, right? <coughs> and so it's possible that when Agabus says "over all the world," that's just that's a a, a colloquialism, a, a term of speech to mean a large area. It's going to affect everybody, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, and so that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, uh, and what a uh, what he apparently is implying is that it's Judea that it needs help. Judea is going to be affected. Where I come from, Agabus is saying. Over, and maybe he means over my world. That's where the famine is going to be. Um, and so they determined to send this relief to Judea. Um, and notice how they do it. The disciples determined everyone, according to his ability... 
to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Have we seen language like this? Do we see language like this anywhere else in the, in the New Testament? Any other? Yeah, exactly. 1 Corinthians 16. Um, let me just turn over there real quick. And uh, this is not probably... No, I'm sure this is not the same instance because this is much later after Paul's um, you know, missionary journeys or during his missionary journeys. But it's the same idea. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, as you determine, right? Um, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. All right, so in the case of Antioch, it was Barnabas and Saul that were accredited to carry the relief to Jerusalem. Um, and he says in verse 4, if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. All right, so, um, so th- this is the way things got done in, in the church. You know, those, those brethren over there need help. We gather the money. We send it by whoever we're going to send it by. Uh, at, at this day and age, we would probably appoint somebody to go to Wells Fargo and send a <laughs> send a wire transfer or something like that. We don't have to actually physically carry it, but um, but there might be value in that actually. So you can actually go with the money and see, you know, actually see what the conditions are, see how people are, and, and see how much more help is needed. Um, that's kind of kind of the reason why. Um, it, I thought it was good when we sent money with Wayne and Mark over to India because they could take the money and say, you know, and see exactly what's going on over there. And so, so that so that's good. All right. So, any comments or questions about the end of Acts chapter eleven before we move on to chapter twelve? We're going to leave Barnabas and Saul. Um, actually, where are Barnabas and Saul at this point? They've now they've left Antioch though. They're in Judea, all right. Okay, so and they've taken money to the elders, and we presume that's the elders at the church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> okay, so we're leaving Barnabas and Saul in Jerusalem, but we're going to stay in Jerusalem, and we're going to talk about King Herod. So let's read chapter twelve. Uh, let's read. Down through verse 19. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James the brother of John with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. 
But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Okay, kind of an exciting story. Um, it's, it's not not unlike another story that, that we've seen with uh, the apostles being arrested by the, the um, high priest and the council. Um, in this case, though, we have kind of a political thing going on. This has nothing to do with religion. This is Herod just trying to score points with the people. And so he lays violent hands on some that belong to the church, and he kills James, the brother of John. This is one of the apostles, um, one of the first four that are called by Jesus. Kills him with a sword. And the Jews like that. So he goes and he grabs Peter also, throws him into prison, and he waits until after Passover to deal with Peter. Um, Because it it would be unseemly to to get the people all riled up while they're trying to to think about Passover and, and that uh, solemn religious ceremony that they, that they engage in. Um, all right, so uh, we have Peter in prison, and the night before Herod's going to bring him out, the angel comes. Now get this, Peter is sleeping between two soldiers. He's bound with two chains, okay? There are sentries at the door guarding the prison. All right, so Peter's not going anywhere. Um, and nobody's coming in to get him, except an angel. An angel comes in, and there's a light in the cell. And so you have to think, the light shines in the cell, it tells Peter to get up, the chains fall off, clank. Why didn't anybody wake up with all of this hubbub going on? Well, because God's at work here, right? Okay, yeah. So, so God's at work here, and he's going to make sure that Peter gets out. Um, the angel leads him out. Um, and, and, and what does Peter think about all this that's happening? Yeah, yeah well, I'm dreaming. This is a vision. This is, you know, um, this is nice, but it's not real. Um, and so then they go out, and the iron gate op- to the city opens all by itself. And then... They go along the street and the angel leaves and Peter finds himself standing by himself and he says, oh, I guess this was real. (laughs) I guess all that actually happened. And now I'm by myself. What do I do now? And so he goes to the house of Mary. Now, Mary is the mother of who? John Mark. How do we know? You've heard of John Mark before. How, How do we know John Mark? What is he famous for? Ah, okay, all right, yeah, that's right. So he he accompanied, we're going to see, John Mark mentioned a little bit later, he accompanies Barnabas and and Paul on missionary journeys, but then there's a problem, because apparently he leaves them and decides, I don't want any more of this, and goes home, and Paul doesn't like that, Barnabas wants to give him a second chance, and so they have a little disagreement, okay? So what else do we know John Mark for? There's a very uh, famous writing that bears his name. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark, right. Okay, so John Mark, this, this guy we were introduced to, is responsible for one of the four Gospels. Um, all right, so, uh, and Mary is his mother, because everybody's got to be ma- named Mary in the church, apparently. And uh, <laughs> um, so... Um, so they're all there gathered and they're praying. What do you think they're praying for? Okay, they're probably praying for Peter, just like they were praying for the apostles when we saw this a few chapters ago. Um, and so they're praying, all they're praying for Peter, and then uh, Peter knocks at the door. 
And so it's kind of a humorous story here, if you picture it. The servant girl, Rhoda, comes out, and she's so excited that Peter's there, she forgets to let him in. And she goes and she runs and tells the other, and they say, oh, you're crazy, what are you talking about? We're, we're, here pray- we're just here praying for Peter, we're not here. <laughs> and he can't be standing outside. Well, what they don't realize is that their prayer has been answered, and of course Peter is there among them. Um, and uh, so they finally figured out, and he comes in and uh, tells them the whole story. And then it says in uh, at the end of verse 17, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Now, I thought James was dead. Isn't that who Herod just killed? Okay, so there's, there's a, the James, the son of Zebedee. But it says James and the brothers. What other James is there that's prominent in the church? Who? who? Christ's brother, James. Right, okay. So uh, that's kind of who I think he's talking about when he says James and the brothers. Um, it could be James, the son of Zebedee. Don't know. Of course, James, Christ's brother, is responsible for another book of the Bible. James. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, the letter from James to the to the uh, Christians. Okay, so then he departed and went to another place. Now this this is interesting to me because the last time we saw the apostles get let out of prison, what do they do? They're in pr- they're in prison. Yeah, they continued to preach. They went right back. And the angel told them to. Yeah, they went right back to the temple and they started teaching some more. Here, it says Peter departed and went to another place. So that's interesting. Maybe, 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 uh, maybe that was the, going to be the best thing to preserve him. Um, that's the only guess. That's the only thing I can come up with. There is that you know. Right. Yeah. So a very different circumstance here, uh, at, at least we can we can conclude. So Peter kind of disappears. You know, I, I get the impression that he kind of goes into hiding for a little while, and he does come back to Jerusalem eventually because we're going to see him in a few chapters uh, when the Judaizing teachers come come out, and uh, and and Paul goes to to Jerusalem to talk about it, and Peter is there. Um, okay. All right. So, of course, um, the next morning, the soldiers are all wondering what happened to Peter. Herod's wondering what happened to Peter, obviously, because you know this is his bo- big moment uh, before his uh, Jewish subjects to score some points, as we said, and uh, his prize is not there. So uh, he's searching for him. He examines the sentries, and uh, we can only guess what that entails. And, uh, of course, orders that they should be put to death because they're ultimately responsible. Um, And so then he goes down from Judea to Caesarea uh, to spend time there. I almost get the impression that um, Herod decides to get out of there to avoid the embarrassment of you know of this of this happening. You know he he lost a prisoner. You know well I'll, I'll just go down to Caesarea and, and get away from this. Let this blow over. Yeah, first, yeah, first kill kill the guards, leave the area, and it'll all blow over soon. So very interesting story, um, and it's not over yet. We're still dealing with Herod here. So let's finish the chapter. Beginning in verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. 
Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. All right, so we're coming full circle here. We're going to end up back in Antioch. Um, And what we saw in Antioch kind of figures into this, I think, because what did Agabus prophesy would happen? Famine, right? And so here we have an issue about food. Uh, with Tyre, between Tyre and Sidon and Herod's kingdom. Tyre and Sidon depends on Herod's kingdom for food. They, they, that trade is vital to them. And so Herod being angry with Tyre and Sidon is not a good thing because he can withhold that trade and make life miserable for them. So uh, they uh, persuade Blastus, the king's chamberlain, his personal assistant, um, they kind of get his ear and they say, you know, speak to speak to Herod for us, get on his help help us get on his good side uh, and make peace. And uh, so it, it looks like what's happening here in verse twenty one is that Herod is going to be magnanimous and show his power and show how wonderful he is how regal he is and how much he cares for the little people and put on his royal robes and get on his throne and give this great oration to the people. And the people are trying to stay on his good side. Um, Maybe they really like his speech, I don't know, but at the very least they're, you know, they're trying to kiss his feet and saying the voice of a god and not a man. Well, apparently Herod is willing to accept this because God lays the responsibility for this at his feet. Right? Because what happens to Herod? He dies. An angel of the Lord, notice God takes responsibility for this, an angel of the Lord strikes him down. And the implication is that uh, he is eaten by worms like immediately. You know, that's, that's the picture I get, is that he falls down and he's eaten by worms. And he breathes his last. And that's the events of his death. Kind of gruesome. Um, And it says it's because he did not give God the glory. Why would anyone expect Herod to give God the glory? I mean, he's a king. What does he care about God? He's... Huh? (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, but... But if we think about the Herods, the Herods have kind of a connection to the Jews. The Herods were um, Idumeans or Edomites that had been put into power by the Romans. And so the the story goes that at one point in Jewish history, they uh, overcome the Edomites. Uh, after all the trouble the Edomites had caused them, they finally overcome the Edomites and they forced them to convert to Judaism. Um, And so they became part of the Jewish nation uh, to some extent. Well, and then the Romans took over and they took the Herods and put them in power over the Jews. So the Herods were not altogether unfamiliar with Judaism and with God. Um, But as we see with the Herods that we see in the New Testament, they don't really care all that much. I mean, we've got Herod that goes trying to kill the Messiah uh, when he's a baby. We have Herod that is a part of the uh, the events of cru- crucifying the Messiah. Um, the Herod that killed uh, John. The Herod that killed James. You know, uh, would you mind uh, ringing the bell for me? Thank you. Let's see if I can silence that. Okay. So, but... The fact is that, you know, it's not altogether, um, it's not altogether, it's not altogether, um, insane is the key word that keeps coming to my head, but that's not the word I'm looking for. It does, it makes, it makes some sense for Herod to be thinking about God and for to have, for him to have God in mind and not to take credit as if he were a God. Um, and so this is 
This is why he's being struck down. Right. He's definitely usurping authority. And this could have happened to any, any king, whether they knew God or not. But Herod should have known better. Um, but look at the next statement. I like the way the juxtaposition here. And I, I think this is intentional. But the word of God increased and multiplied. So here we have the people saying to Herod, the voice of a God and not a man. And he's struck dead. <laughs> the word of God, the actual word of God, increased and multiplied. And so, I, I think that's there for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, uh, so Herod has, uh, has paid for his sins. Um, or has begun to pay for his sins. And then we have uh, Barnabas and Saul in verse 25, returning from Jerusalem after they completed their work, which was to what? What was their work in Jerusalem? Right. Okay, to bring the relief to Judea. So they completed that work, and they brought with them John, whose other name was was Mark. John Mark, as we call him. And so... um, that sets us up back in Antioch. That sets us up for Paul's first missionary journey in chapter 13. And so we will pick up there next time. Is there any, anything I've missed? Any comments or, or questions that uh, we should uh, discuss? We have just a few minutes. Yes. Oh, yeah, Cornelius. So, yeah, so this is... Okay, so in the case of these Gentiles, yes. Um, But the purpose, what, what was the purpose of that, do you think? Right, and, and that's exactly what, what, it, what it did. It showed Peter, okay, in case, in case you have any doubt about this, I'm with them, Peter, okay? Because that's exactly what Peter does. He says, they've got the Spirit just like we did at the beginning. How, can we refuse them? Can anybody refuse them water to be baptized? See? And so that was the purpose of, of God doing that, was to, to show Peter... I'm accepting these people into my, into my church. And so they need to be baptized. All right? Um, but, but, we, but not to confuse that, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because Peter equates it to that, but not to confuse that with the baptism this, this of salvation, the baptism of forgive, for, for the forgiveness of sins. That is the water baptism. And that's why Peter commanded them to be baptized uh, at that point. Good question. All right. Uh, it does. It, it's, hard, it's hard to read that passage and come away feeling like, well, you know, may, they could have been baptized, they could have not been baptized, you know, whatever they felt like. No! Peter's, Peter commanded them <laughs> to be baptized after the Holy Spirit had already already fallen on them. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. And Peter stayed with them for several days. Yeah. It says, um, "Let's see where where is that?" Uh, he commanded. Uh, well. Oh, the Holy Spirit falls on them. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't specifically say that they rejoiced, but you know, <laughs> we know they did. <laughs> they, were, they were definitely happy for Peter to be there. All right. Uh, so, any other questions? Since we're still waiting for the class to come back. All right, well, that'll, that'll do then. We'll pick up the, the Acts chapter 13 next on Sunday.